Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 67, Balancing Emotions. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my funny and entertaining co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Maddie? Pretty good, like I always am. Well, that's good. I'm glad. It's very, it's a very uh, positive outlook. Uh, we did have a, a brief false start. I seem to be having more and more technical difficulties as we get further into the podcast here. Uh, which should serve as an inspiration to put, I bought a new Blackmagic video switcher that will actually simplify. It's a pretty sophisticated piece of hardware, but it will uh, simplify the current setup that we have here. And if I keep having problems here, I'm going to have to put that in as soon as possible to try to get, get past all these problems. But that's not what we're here for today. Today we're talking about balancing emotions. Um... Do you think you have issues balancing emotions? I mean, at times, definitely knew. I definitely know when I first experienced change in emotion, I was not very stable and could not balance out my emotions very well. Okay. Well, what we're going to look at today is uh, this one particular uh, website that had kind of a interesting approach on how to balance your emotions. It's sort of a, a five-step approach for emotional well-being and this was this topic itself was spawned from the Q&A session from last week obviously yeah. so when i went to do the research on emotional health i guess was what what i was searching for uh there was a lot of resources out there we've talked about a number of things already uh we've had a couple of podcasts on on how to handle emotional situations and stuff uh, but when i was reading this one uh, it had some some things that I hadn't read before, and it kind of caught my attention, and I thought it might be an interesting topic for us to talk about. Um, so we're going to talk about the five different techniques that they have, and, and we'll see if any of these kind of resonate with you and if, if any of it makes sense for you and and if it's things that you do or can do or, you know, are comfortable doing. All righty. So shall we get into it? We shall. All right, let's commence shelling. So the website in question is the newportacademy.com and they have all kinds of resources for mental health and coaching and stuff like that. So it's a great resource. So they talk about five ways to for teens to balance emotions and emotional well-being. And the first thing that they talk about is something that they call learn to ride the wave. And I thought that was kind of a, a cool summary of all the things that they have here. So they talk about uh, that when teens feel intense emotions, they sometimes try to push those feelings away. And that can be true even for emotions that are good emotions like pride or love or joy. Because our feelings can be scary and overwhelming at times. Um, let me ask you, do you find that when you're in a highly emotional state that it's something that you try to push that away? Or, or is that something where you try to embrace those feelings and try to sort of wrestle them to the ground? Or do you try to avoid those emotions? Well, I am guilty of trying to avoid those emotions for multiple um, different times. I definitely know that whenever I was like sad or stressed from school and I just didn't feel 
like myself and my emotions were all whack, I would just try and push them down by distracting myself because I didn't want to think about it again. Yeah, and that's sort of what they're talking about here. Um, they go on to say that riding the wave is a tool that helps teens become more comfortable with experiencing what's happening inside of them. Uh, instead of self-medicating with drugs or alcohol or distracting themselves with technology and entertainment, it's a way to confront, not necessarily confront, because it's not a confrontational thing. It's a way to acknowledge the emotions and what's causing the emotions. And it, it's a methodology of allowing you to deal with them. And if you if you think about a boat on the ocean, Okay, this is where the term, you know, ride the wave comes from. If you're a boat on the ocean in a storm, you don't want to fight the waves. You know, you want to ride the waves out because the waves have a natural pattern that they're going to follow. And you're more inclined to be safe if you follow that pattern. If you, if you have the boat ride the direction of the waves of the direction that the storm is going, you're much safer that way. And it's easier to navigate the boat that way than if you're trying to fight against the waves and fight against the storm. Okay. And that's kind of where the, where it came from. So here's a couple of, of hints on how you ride the wave when feelings threaten to overwhelm you. The first is to pay attention to your breath and consciously make it slower and deeper. What's the first thing that I tell you when you tend to get upset? You always tell me to take a deep breath and do some breathing exercises because it helps me calm down. Yeah, yeah, because you're breathing. Like the other day, we were working on your scales for your trumpet, right? And you were having some difficulty, and you started to get upset. And the first thing that happens is you start to breathe real quick, and you start to hyperventilate. What happens with that is it that that's not helping you think clearly. And in fact, that tends to panic you even more and it gets you further down that spiral. So breathing is very important. Um, and you know that from uh, meditation, you know that from just general wellness, health wellness. Um, you know, take a deep breath. If things are starting to overwhelm you, step back, take a deep breath. In through the nose, out through the mouth, take three breaths and then attack the problem again. And that's usually the safest thing. The next thing they talk about is relax your body. Let the muscles release from head to toe. Because one of the first things we do when we get upset is we tend to tense up, right? Mm -hmm. And when we do that, that tenseness is reflected in our mentality. You know, when we look at things, when we're upset and we get tense, mm -hmm. that, that stiffness of the body is how we tend to respond emotionally as well. Plus it takes a lot of energy to tense the whole body up. Um, so if you're dealing with something, you know, other than your trumpet, you know, if there's something that's upsetting you, you want to make sure that you can focus on that. You have the energy and the, and the, the clarity in which to do that. So you, you know, relax the body, deep breathe. Again, these are all physical things that you do that will help your mental stability when you're dealing with these things. Okay. Uh, the next one they talk about is tune in to the feelings you're experiencing in your body and your mind. So when you're upset, go with it, accept those feelings. And when you accept those feelings, then you can look at what's causing that. And then you can objectively try to address those things. Um, let's, you know, briefly we'll talk about, cause it's the one incident that comes to mind right now is the trumpet incident. So you were trying to do this one particular lesson that we had to record for your teacher and the lesson involved high notes that you couldn't do and you started to get upset. What was your, what was your thinking at that point in time? What was causing that, that upset in you? Well, I guess just the fact that I wasn't able to do it and just feeling as though I wasn't good enough for that because um, there, 
Um, in our band class, there are two different classifications for each instrument. There's either, um, for our trumpet, it's either trumpet one or trumpet two. If you're trumpet two, you get the lower notes because it's harder for you to get those higher notes. And I am apparently classified under number one, um, the trumpet one, which they get the higher notes and the more intense music. Um, so, so there's an expectation that you need to perform at a higher level because of that. Yeah. So your concern was because you weren't hitting the notes in this lesson that you weren't good enough for trumpet one. So is trumpet two bad? No, it's not. Um, I definitely think that they work just as hard as us. I just feel as though that I shouldn't be a trumpet one since I'm unable to hit the higher notes. Okay. Well, and again, when we look at it objectively from that perspective, maybe that's the alternative that we go with. Maybe it's not a, I need to be coached more, I need to be taught more, I need to learn a different technique. Maybe it's, I'm not a trumpet one, I'm a trumpet two. You know, in which case, then there's really not much to get upset over there. They go on to say, observe what you're feeling with compassion and without judging yourself. And I think this is kind of where you fall short is you tend to judge yourself pretty harshly. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. That judgment of yourself is what drives you to achieve the excellence that you do so consistently across the board on everything else. So don't think of it as a negative, but like mommy and daddy tell you all the time, you can't be so hard on yourself because then you're going to start to discourage yourself. So compassion, look at yourself with the same compassion that you would look on someone else who is struggling because you're a very compassionate person and you would never judge someone else harshly because they weren't able to do something like that or because they were upset about something. So, treat yourself the same way that you would treat others. You tend to treat yourself much more harshly than you would others. And when you get to the point where you're getting upset, that's kind of counterproductive. It's good to want to get straight A's like you do. And you're very hard on yourself to do that. And you are um, very effective at achieving your goals by doing that. But there are times that you're going to fall short of those goals. And when you do... You can't come down on yourself because you wouldn't do it to someone else. So if you're not, not going to do it to someone else, you shouldn't do it to yourself. So treat yourself with the same compassion that you treat others with. And I think that's really the biggest lesson to be learned from, from this section. Um, like, you know, you don't, you're not judging. You're not a very judgmental person when it comes to other people, are you? And you tend to be very compassionate to other people. Yeah, like if they made the same mistakes I would, I did, then I would try and make sure to do everything in my power to help them out, yet I don't treat myself with the same respect. Yeah, well, and I don't know if it's respect. I think it's just that you have very high expectations for yourself, and you, when you fail to live up to your own expectations, you tend to be hard on yourself. Um, and that's not to say that you should stop having those expectations, but you can't let them get to the point where they discourage you and get you upset because you're judging yourself on it. Um, but you know, everybody makes mistakes. Not everybody is cut out to do everything that they want to do. Um, you know, growing up is about finding what your limitations are and what your capabilities are. And a lot of times it's about, extending what your capabilities are, learning new things and stepping outside your comfort zone. And sometimes that's very uncomfortable. So you have to do it kind of compassionately towards yourself. The last thing they talk about here is continue to let the feelings be there without pushing them away as the waves recede. So as you're coming down off of this period of being upset, you have to continue to acknowledge that those feelings are there and let those feelings drive you. You know, if, if you got upset because you couldn't do something, 
then that's not necessarily a bad thing. The cause is still there. But what you need to do is turn those feelings into something productive. And the first thing I tell you when you start to get upset is, well, that's not going to solve the problem, right? Mm -hmm. So what do we do from there? Then we, you help me calm myself down, and then we actually look at the problem. Right. You know, you have to attack the problem. And, and you know, what did we do for the trumpet? Um, what we did was you helped me calm down, and you gave me a few um, breathing tips. And at the point where we realized, and then, sorry, um, then I tried it again. And when we realized that I couldn't hit those high notes, you were like, Okay, why don't we just why don't we just give him, um why don't we just send in a test run just to show him how just to show your band teacher how um you can't hit those higher notes and ask him for any tips. Right. Now have you gotten any feedback from him on that yet? I haven't looked at it yet. Um probably have already though. Okay. But yeah, I mean that's where we came to an impasse. We tried a couple of different takes on it. We tried a couple of different techniques. We just came to the conclusion that you couldn't hit those notes right now. That's not to say you won't be able to hit them in six months when school starts again, but right now you can't. And we had to deal with that. So the assignment was to complete those lessons and record them and send them in. So we did. You completed them as best as you could. So mission accomplished there. But what we discovered was that you were falling short of what you had to do. And we had to figure out why. So now we'll go from there and see where we, where we wind up. But getting upset never got us anywhere. So that's what we're kind of talking about here. Like, like take those emotions, let those emotions flow through you. Don't try to hide them or push them away. But let that flow of emotions lead to a positive outcome. Yeah. Right? Yep. So, so that was our section on learn to ride the wave. Uh, let's go on to the next one. And then maybe we'll take a quick break after that. So the next one that they talk about is meditation and mindfulness. And we've, we've talked about meditation in the past. They say the ability to quiet the mind and stem the flow of wandering thoughts has multiple mental health benefits. Teens can start by learning how to meditate with a teacher. Then they can establish a habit of taking a few moments each day to practice this skill. A review study at John Hopkins found the effect of meditation on symptoms of anxiety and depression was exactly the same as the effect of antidepressant medications. So this tells me that we have the ability to self-heal from these mental conditions without having to medicate. Um, now, you've done some meditation in the past. Uh, mommy worked with you and so forth. Yeah. How, how, how do you feel about meditation? Do you find that it's beneficial? Um, in a way, yes, the way that we did it. Um, what we did was we listened to some calming music. Um, we both closed our eyes and we took a, in a few deep breaths and, um, basically cleared our minds. And that's, that's, you know, fairly straightforward. It's the idea of meditation itself is the idea of, of calming your thoughts in your mind. Cause I, I mean, I know teens tend to have very, I don't mean this in a derogatory term, but very cluttered minds. Um, e even I do, you know, I, I go to work and I've got, you know, 12 projects I'm juggling at one time. And there's a lot that's rattling around in my head. And sometimes I have to sort of shut down everything in the outside world, step back, close my eyes and sort of focus and, and try to calm all that stuff that's going on then I can step back into that role and do things more effectively. Mm -hmm. Now, do you meditate regularly? Um, not usually. I only normally do it when I'm upset. Um, and I normally look to mommy for that because I don't meditate on my own time or I don't really meditate on my own at least. Okay. And, and meditation is something that 
you can do at any point in time. And there are a lot of different techniques for meditation. It depends on what you're trying to accomplish. One of the things they talk about is uh, meditation reduces what they call the quote unquote wandering mind, uh, which is associated with unhappiness. Um, and that's one of these things where like if you can't go to sleep at night because your brain's all over the place and your, your mind's very active and you can't settle down mentally to go to sleep, that's one place where meditation can help. Um, one thing that I find, uh, I mentally build things because I can't physically build them. I just lack, <laughs> I, I lack the skills to do it. Yeah. So what I'll do is I'll build a house and I'll picture myself and playing the Sims. Now you can relate to this. Yeah. I'll picture myself putting down the foundation and putting in the floor and putting up the walls and painting it. And that's how I do it because it's a very systematic approach. And just that visualization and that expectation of what I have to do next helps to order my thoughts in my mind and it calms my brain down. It makes it easier to fall asleep. Have you ever tried anything along those lines, sort of visualization meditation? I mean, I remember that you actually gave me one example one time because um, I remember during uh, the night after, before, well, um, winter break had ended for us and for this year. And for some reason, the night where I was supposed to go back to um, school, I just couldn't fall asleep whatsoever. My mind was just racing and I was an emotional mess. So that was fun. And... Um, you had told me before, like, um, to picture yourself in a pool, um, and you're floating, and, um, basically your body was a pool, and all you needed, and your brain was basically rippling. Right. Um, and all you needed to do was picture, like, the ripples calming down, and, um, eventually becoming just nice and smooth, and then that would have... And then that helped me kind of fall asleep. Yeah. And actually, you know what? I use that technique quite often for pain management where I will picture, you know, my body is a vessel and it's filled with liquid and wherever I have a pain, my ankle, my back, my arm, whatever, that area is very turbulent, a lot of waves there. And, and what I will do is I will, in my meditations, I will envision myself passing you know, calmness over that, like, like blowing air across the, the surface of the water and it calms it down. And as I, as I pass that through my body and I exhale, every time I exhale, it calms a little bit more. And in doing that, I'm able to actually focus away a lot of that pain. So it's not that, that difficult for me. Cause I have a lot of issues with, with leg pain at night and stuff like that. So I tend to meditate that way for pain management too. Yeah. So the next thing they talk about is it helps to increase empathy. You know what empathy is? I might need an, a definition for it. Empathy is your ability to relate to the emotional state of other people. Ah. So if you see someone is upset and you go over to console them, you do that because you're empathetic towards them. Um, and this is part of that whole compassion part. You know, you show compassion to people because of the empathy that you feel. You're, you're, you're empathic. Um, when you see someone gets upset, you see someone is sad, you want to try to try to help them. So meditation allows you, one, because you're more mentally stable. It allows you to be able to help people like that. Whereas if you're walking around brooding and depressed all the time because, you know, you're in this unbalanced state, you're really not in a position to help other people. But through meditation, in this case here, you're balancing yourself. You can help other people. But it also makes you more observant of the emotional states of other people. Um, especially if it's something you've gone through. The loss of a loved one. Um, social shunning of people, you know, someone bullying someone, something like that. If it's, if it's something that you've gone through, 
and you have conquered it yourself, you tend to be much more observant of others who are going through it. And it, it makes you more capable of helping those people. So it helps to increase your empathy. Um, they say it also decreases ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which nowadays doctors prescribe medication for these kids all the time who have ADHD. Uh, and this is one area that, that really struck me in this study from John Hopkins is that meditation has the same effect as, as the med as the, the meditation has the same effect of the medication. So if you can avoid putting, you know, chemicals into your body to control your thoughts and you can control them yourself, that's a win-win yeah. any day. It helps to improve concentration and attention. Um, where do you think an improvement in concentration and attention would help you? Um, I guess trying to... Um better concentrate in uh, when with difficult subjects I definitely know like math sometimes it's difficult for me to figure out a problem since I am in advanced math and sometimes the problems and um, the solutions are kind of difficult for me to find so I have to I should I um the focus could probably be used um, and Focus and concentration would probably work on that. And I, I would agree with you 100% there. I was never particularly strong in math, as we've discussed in the past. Uh, and I always found that if it wasn't a concept that I grasped quickly, uh, I very quickly lost focus and attention on it. Uh, so the ability to concentrate would certainly help there. They say it also enhances the brains, the areas of the brain associated with well-being self-regulation and learning. So we're talking about actual chemical changes in the brain to help your brain sort of work differently or remap itself. Um, and that's kind of the interesting thing about the brain is the brain is not unlike other organs of the body where there is a specific function and that's all it does. And it does that over and over, you know, Organs can deteriorate, but they don't change. And your brain changes. You know, different parts of your brain fire off for different reasons. Um, you know, there's a lot of popular studies that talk about the fact that we only use maybe 30% of our brain at, a, at any given moment, but we're using different parts of it. But what meditation allows you to do is to unlock different parts of your brain and use more of your brain in different ways. Uh, this was very well demonstrated in this particular documentary that I had watched on meditation where they had taken a Buddhist monk and they put uh, a sensor, a, a hat on his head and it had electrodes that, that measured his brain waves. And they just had a conversation with him to get a baseline and they saw how his brain was working and everything was normal and everything. Then they asked him to go into a transcendental state, which is a technique of, of meditation that the Buddhist monks do. And after a few minutes of him entering this transcendental state, they looked at the map of the brain and it was completely different. Oops. It was completely different. Like there were areas of the brain that were firing off that most humans never even use. So the fact that you could even put your brain in that kind of state was just amazing to me. Um, so that's how powerful meditation can be. Uh, they say meditation decreases the volume of the amygdala, which is, a res which is responsible for fear, anxiety, and stress. And we talked about this in our fear podcast, is the amygdala is what really controls our response to fear. So... Meditation allows you to control the physical aspect of that part of your body, which in turn allows you to control these emotions, the fear, the anxiety, and the stress. Now, again, that's one of those things that doctors tend to prescribe medication to, I guess, numb the amygdala to, to get around some of those things. 
But it's just, it's kind of cool to think that, well, you can do that yourself if you learn to meditate. Yeah. So there's a tremendous amount of benefits to meditation when it comes to controlling emotions. I think we're going to have to explore meditation a little bit more. Teach you different techniques and get you doing it. Even once a night, you take 15 minutes to meditate before you go to bed. I think you'll see a huge difference. So before we go on to the next portion, which I know you're going to love because it's physical exercise, oh, great. let's take a quick break. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Civ Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. So physical exercise, and, and we've talked about physical exercises as, as being beneficial mentally several times in the past, uh, as, as we've also talked about the fact that you're not a big fan of physical exercise. Yeah. So let's just talk about some of the benefits. We'll hit some of the, the highlights here. So they say exercise is a great way for teens to let off steam, and focus on something other than their thoughts. So if you don't get that effect through physical exercise, how else do you let off steam and focus on something else other than your emotions? Well, I normally do that by, I guess, either talking to you or mommy or the cats. Um, I definitely... Um, like having conversations with you guys and like giving the cats personalities. Um, and I definitely think that just having small conversations with you guys and just playing with the cats definitely takes my mind off of troubling emotions. Okay, I could see that. They say physical activity gets teenagers out of their heads and into their bodies. Consequently, it forces them to be in the present moment. Um, so it's one of these things where, you know, we have this, this characteristic image of the brooding teenager, you know, head down, angry, sad, whatever it is. And, and, and it's true. And that's because they tend to dwell on other things. You know, you and I have had these discussions where someone at school says something or does something or. You know, they exclude you from something, and it's something that wears on you, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the idea here is, well, you know what? Let's get out. Let's go for a walk, or let's go have a catch, or let's take the lightsabers out, and let's go have a, you know, a lightsaber duel, whatever it is. It, it forces you to focus on what you're doing at the moment there. So your thoughts can't be wandering off to these negative places, to these, these little uh, touch points that set you off. So there's an advantage. It's almost meditative, really, in, in bringing, drawing that focus into, I need, to, I need to throw the ball and I need to pay attention to catch it or it's going to hit me in the face. Yeah. You know, as, as simple and silly as that sounds, it's effective. You know, we go out and, and we burn off some of that pent up energy from time to time. And we're not thinking about the things that bother us or anything like that. You know, I come home from a stressful day at, at work and, you know, I'm still thinking of the 15 different things that happened at work that day that set me off. The ability, that's why, you know, I kind of miss walking. I used to get home from work and before I even walked in the house, 
I'd get out of my car and I'd, I'd do my three laps around the neighborhood. And it was very meditative. Uh, my old job, uh, I used to work an hour or so away. So that hour-long drive served as that uh, decompression time for me. And everyone sort of has to find that niche. Um, what is that niche for you? What do you do that when you're doing something, if it's not physical activity, you get into an activity and that eats up all your focus and you can shut out the rest of the world? What is that for you? I guess that would actually be drawing um, for the most part. Um, drawing when, like characters or just... Um, making a small little doodle. Um, I'm honestly kind of a perfectionist when it comes to drawing. I ne I always want all my lines to be straight, all the curves to look like actual circles and curves and stuff. And for me, that takes my mind off of uh, any troubling thoughts that I would have had for the day because drawing as sort of a perfectionist means that I... Uh, Whenever I make a small little mistake, I need to go back and fix it, and I'm just too focused on making it look like a good drawing um, to actually focus on anything else besides that. Yeah, and that's exactly what they're talking about with the physical activity. Now, there are other benefits to the physical activity as well. Uh, for instance, exercise releases endorphins that are a natural mood lifter. Um, when you get out there and you're... you're uh, Adrenaline's pumping and you get the blood pumping. It, it uplifts you. It gives you more energy physically and mentally. Um, and physical activities create a sense of achievement that boosts a teen's self-confidence, or at least they're supposed to. You know, you have a lot of uh, instances in gym class that are quite the opposite, which is unfortunate. But for the most part, when you get out there, if, as long as it's not super competitive... I know there are, there are a lot of kids your age that are super competitive, right? Yeah. Um, but do you find, what physical activity do you find rewarding just doing? Is it walking or swimming or anything like that? Um, it would have to be like swimming and um, like throwing a ball with you. Like for swimming, um, I've never been a perfect swimmer. I remember in third grade, I remember after third grade during summer camp, um, mommy had signed me up for swim lessons because um, I was having a bit of trouble swimming. Um, although, and although I didn't exactly learn too much, I was able to um, I was able to learn how to swim a bit, and um, I definitely feel accomplished when I'm able to actually swim across and keep my head up because that's important when you're in water because you don't want to be underwater for your for the entire time you need air um most humans do yeah yeah and whenever i'm throwing um a ball with you i'm honestly surprised that i'm even able to catch it because i tend to get afraid of the ball and i don't want it to hit me and it's a natural reflex for me to just run away from well it. and like when you and I do it, there's no pressure, there's no expectations, there's no judgment. You know, it's just here. Let's let's go out and have a catch. Let's burn some calories. Let's eat up some energy and and have fun. Yeah, I don't get that satisfaction when I had to throw the ball, or we were learning about how to throw a ball in football, um, for f uh, how to. Throw a football in our football unit for gym. I never got that satisfaction because there was a lot of pressure and the kids were just way too competitive. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I mean kids are like that. There's there's a lot of competition there. And there's a lot of judgment from the other kids. Yeah. Um, so there was a a 2012 research study that looked at a range of different studies showing that aerobic exercise, exercise that got the heart pumping. Um, or strength training can significantly reduce depression. Uh, there was a study of a dozen students at the University of Newcastle in Australia, and these participants had major depressive disorders, and they exercised regularly, three times a week with a trainer, and on their own on the other days. 
After 12 weeks of exercise, 10 of the participants were no longer categorized as depressed. Mm. And that's just from depressed, just from exercise. Yeah. Um, according to another study, exercise regularly, exercising regularly and frequently is more important than the intensity level of your workout. So even just a simple walk going out there and, and spending that time because it, it allows you to be reflective of, of everything else around you too. Um, but the fact that you can cure, you know, clinically you can cure depression with exercise is, again, it's one of those things where they're using medication to treat that. Mm -hmm. And if a little bit of exercise each day can help that, that's huge. Yeah. So the next thing that they talk about is one that we've talked about in the past as well. We've actually had a whole podcast on it. And that is what they call sleep hygiene. So we've talked about sleep and issues with that in the past. Yeah, it was even part of our last podcast. It was. So they say it may seem strange that getting more sleep improves the way teens feel when they're awake. Researchers have found that teens feel more depressed when they don't get enough sleep, which makes it harder to handle challenges and deal with strong emotions. Not getting enough sleep can increase teens' likelihood of using drugs and alcohol. Now, when we talked about uh, sleep in our podcast dedicated to sleep, we found that there was a huge alarming number of teens who did not get enough sleep. Um, you were among them. You know, you weren't getting enough sleep at the time. With all the stuff going on with COVID and, and schedules messed up, how is your sleep now? Do you think you're getting enough sleep at this point? I feel sort of like it. I mean, although I go to bed late and wake up early, um, I do feel as though sometimes I do get um, a good enough sleep. Um, I'm able to fall asleep with within at least an hour of actually going to bed, which was surprising from the last time, went from the time when we did do the podcast when it took me almost two hours to fall asleep. Yeah, I remember you were really struggling for a while there until we got that under control. Yeah. Do you feel mentally any different getting more sleep? Um, I mean, yeah. I feel like I have more energy than I did before. Um, and I feel as though I'm slightly more awake, at least, you know, after I get the symptoms of feeling like, oh, great, it's a school day, like, and having, like, to wake myself up. Well, do you feel it's helped awake. with any anxiety issues you may have had or any depressive issues that you had? Do you feel any less of that? I mean, yeah, like, when I, um, what? When I wasn't able to get enough sleep, it was mainly due to the fact that I kept thinking about all the stuff that happened at school yesterday, that day, and then what will happen tomorrow, and just a bunch of other worries in general. And now um, I'm able to get enough. I'm able to get a better sleep because I'm no longer thinking about that, um, and I'm able to calm my brain down enough to the well. Actually, I actually really saw an important impact when we, um, I took that time with mommy to watch a movie for an hour. Yeah, that is huge. You've, I've seen a huge turnaround in just your overall um, demeanor. You know, you're much more positive and upbeat with that. Mm -hmm. Plus, I think mommy enjoys the time she gets to spend with you, too. Yeah, and so do I. So it's very nice. Speaking of a lack of sleep, one study conducted by the Centers for Disease Control, which reinforces what we talked about previously, showed that less than 9% of teens get enough sleep and the amount of sleep they get decreases as they progress through school. So that is something we definitely have to keep an eye on and we have to make sure that we're on top of that as we go through. So they have a couple of suggestions uh, five ways that parents can help teens get to bed earlier and sleep better. And it's funny because some of these we actually have already tried. The first being set an electronic curfew. Teens use of technology often interferes with getting enough sleep. Turning off their computers and cell phones at a fixed time each night will help their brains wind down and help get ready for sleep. What did we do? How do we apply that for you? Um, well... 
I had gotten, I normally went to bed at 9, and you decided that an hour beforehand, it would be, like, at 8 o'clock, we would turn off my technology, I'd get off my phone or my tablet or computer, whatever I was going on, and then that rest of the hour, I would just, um, do something other than technology, but, t um, watching TV was an okay for it, and that turned into movie night with mommy, when we would spend that hour just watching a movie. Yeah. Yeah, that, that seems to have worked out very well. Mm -hmm. They also say create a bedtime routine. Uh, they can do relaxing activities before bed instead of using technology such as reading, taking a shower, listening to quiet music, or meditating. Um, your choice happens to be, you know, movie time uh, with mommy, which I think works out very well for both of you because it allows both of you because mommy goes to bed around the same time you do. Yeah. So I think that is a nice wind down for mommy too to get into the sleep mode. Yeah, I also, when I do get to bed, um, I actually do end up reading some comics. Um, I, I just find that reading helps me like just not focus on any of my negative emotions and just focus on what I'm reading and all the funny stuff that's going on in the comic. Yeah, and that's, that's another great example. Just the same effect that exercise has of, of making you focus on what's in front of you. Um, they say get them up at the usual time on weekend mornings, sleeping till noon, and then staying up late will throw off the schedule. So how do you do that on the weekends? Do you stick to a normal schedule you know, plus or minus an hour or two here and there, or are you, like, running wildly variable schedules on the weekend? Well, I'm really not that insane about it. I do sleep slightly later than I... I don't actually get up at noon. I don't actually get up at noon. I get up around 7 or 7.30, something around that time. Um, but you guys don't really notice that I do that, and because I normally just stay in my room for an hour, and then I come out because I need food and sustenance. You come out to, to forage, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the next thing they talk about is make sure the bedroom is dark enough. Uh, light can interfere with the sleep cycle. Use blackout curtains to make sure daylight is not disturbing. Fortunately, your room is not a problem because you've only got the one window. And it's honestly not able to see too much. Well, and it's half covered up with a window air conditioner, too. So there's a minimal amount of light that comes through. Yeah, but there is a problem that I am afraid of the dark, so it can't be too dark. Right. So we keep, uh, what do we call it, uh, mood lighting, sort of, because we have the adjustable bulbs so we can set the color we can set the temperature so we can set it so it's a nice conducive sleep um, light that you have not a blaring sunlight coming in yeah. and the last thing they talk about on this was one that i am in favor of and that is keep the bedroom cool the body prepares for sleep by lowering its internal temperature and a cool room can encourage that process you know me i love to sleep when it's frigid me too. Um, so that's important. And that's actually a problem I've been facing recently. Um, um, my room can get pretty warm, especially now as the heat gets up. I do have the air conditioner and my one fan, but it sometimes I can't turn on the air conditioning because if we have too much air blowing out, then it's going to then it's just gonna break. It's just gonna turn off everything. So I need to be careful with that. Um, but. And I used to normally wear, like, sweatpants to bed, and I've noticed that I just really get sweaty and it's harder for me to fall asleep. Well, they are called sweatpants for a reason. Yes, I, I used to wear them because I was getting a little too cold at night and they were more comfortable, but yeah. Well, I will say, since I redid my office area downstairs, I think we balanced the electrical load better. So you shouldn't have too much in the way of problems running your air conditioner if you need to run it. Okay. So that should help things. So that was all we had on that topic. We will take another quick break and we'll come back with creativity and flow. Ooh. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. 
our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Artistic expression is a powerful way for teens to release and manage emotions. When it's difficult to talk about what you're going through, it's helpful to find other ways to let out what you're feeling. In addition, creativity induces a state of flow, the experience of being completely absorbed in an activity. When we're engaged in a flow activity, our brain waves shift to the alpha waves associated with rest and relaxation and the theta waves that occur during meditation. So that all means that everything that you do when you're drawing is exactly the right thing to do. And this is also why mommy and daddy are very encouraging of you when it comes to your creative endeavors, whether it's drawing or writing or whatever else it is. Do you find your artistic outlet to be sort of a form of meditation for you? Definitely. I definitely know that, well, I can say from experience that whenever I, like, make a character or write a story on a character, I definitely feel very relaxed and it clears my mind from any negative thoughts because I'm just too focused on writing the story or creating the character. And the thing is, I think I'm overly creative because I just come up with a random scenario right off the bat like when I'm just relaxing and I'm not really doing anything I'll just think of a scenario in my head that a character is going through and I'll play that and I'll play out that scenario in my head and event and I'll also kind of talk to myself so yeah I'm really overly creative I agree and I think that's a wonderful thing because it's self uh, therapeutic uh, they talk about the benefits for teenagers being in the flow, you know, with creativity. They say you feel happier, you have higher self-esteem, you feel greater optimism, you have an increased concentration level, you have decreased focus on disturbing thoughts, better coping skills, and more time spent with friends. So let me let me just draw on that last one there i know it's it's difficult right now to spend time with friends but did you find that your creativity and your art was a way that you spent time with your friends in the past i mean yeah like one time when i was hanging out with my friends i brought my one notebook with all my characters and we spent like a whole i don't know 15 minutes looking at them and i was able to describe them and i actually when I first started making comics in fourth grade, I had actually inspired my one friend, Lindsay, to actually, for her to actually start creating comics as well, based on one of the t um, t Netflix series that we were watching, and she based it off of characters that were in the show and characters that we created ourselves. I think that's awesome. You know, anytime that you're creative on your own, it's a wonderful thing and it's helpful to you. The ability to inspire others to be creative, I think, is just fantastic. So kudos to you for that. So that was, you know, I was going to spend more time on this, but, you know, we, we kind of talked about a lot of this stuff with the athletics and, and your artwork. So I think it's important. I think supporting our children when it comes to their artistic endeavors and their creative outlets. And that creativity might not be art. That creativity could be... Um, you know, Legos, you know, a lot of people don't consider Legos art, but it's that process that gets the brain flowing, you know, anything that gets you into that point. Um, even video games can be 
um, included in this. Um, even, you know, I've spent hours playing Minecraft. You spent hours playing Minecraft. There are quality video games out there that spark the creativity and the imagination and get you into that flow. Yeah, like th to throw an example, The Sims. The Sims, you can create an entire family or an entire household, and then you can spend a bunch of time creating their house, and that's kind of what I've been doing. Um, I actually created our family, and I've tried to remake our house, and it definitely got me um, thinking about maybe getting maybe a possible career as an interior decorator, and I just find it very therapeutic, and I get to release my creativity on something else other than drawing or writing. Yeah, The Sims is actually a very interesting example because it's a ready-made environment for storytelling. Um, and there's, there's a few instances where games and game engines have provided that type of environment. And I'm going to throw one out there that's sort of an off-the-wall one, but we watched The Mandalorian on Disney+. Plus. And The Mandalorian uses, really, we watched the, an episode of the documentary on it last night. It uses this really cool cutting-edge technology of video walls. So when they're walking through the desert and the camera's panning around and it's seeing a desert, they're not in the desert. They're on a soundstage somewhere, and they're not using green screens like a lot of um, movies do when they film on a stage. They're literally in a 360-degree theater. It's all LED screens on the roof as well, and it uses the Unreal Game Engine to render all of these landscapes so that it looks realistic, so that you're getting the light. So games have come to the point with The Sims and Minecraft and the Unreal Engine and all this stuff, they allow whole new levels of creativity for us and provide an outlet for that creativity where you know, you've know, built entire families in The Sims. You and I have been playing The Sims for the last week or so. I've created entire families and I've lived entire lifetimes you know, the span of a few hours on The Sims where it would be difficult to recreate that type of scenario efficiently outside. Yeah, we could go out and write the stories and stuff, but it's like the ultimate form of make-believe. Yeah. So it's, it's really, a lot of people tend to um, get down on video games as being a waste of time or the, you know, these are, this is why kids are, are violent and stuff like that. And, and, you know, there might be some validity to that, but, there's a lot of positive stuff that comes out of video games. Uh, you, we had mentioned last week in your, your dark secrets um, that you and I would play Call of Duty. And, you know, Call of Duty and first-person shooters like that have come under fire for, for being overly violent. And, you know, people think that it spurs gun violence in the school shootings and stuff like that. And, and I'm not an expert on the subject to say one way or the other whether it does or not. What I know is, is that when you and I have done it, it's been because you've had a rough day at school, you've been frustrated, you've been upset, someone's gotten on your nerves, and we sit there and we shoot pixels. You know, we're not hurting anybody, we're not causing any harm, we're not causing any damage, and it's a great stress relief. And when you're done, you feel 100% better. If that's a therapy that it takes to make you feel better, more power to you. It's who's who's who is it to tell you that that's not the right thing to do for you? Yeah, just look at the results. Right. So there are a lot of video games out there that that promote creativity and flow. So it's important to keep that in mind. Um, that was all I had for the subject this week. Uh, I figure we'll come back and we'll get your closing remarks. Alrighty. Go for closing remarks. Alrighty, so although this is mainly targeted towards the teens out there, I know that there are other people out there that have emotional issues as well. I wanted to say that I hope this video will be able to help um, 
the five ways to help you control your emotions. I definitely know when I was first experiencing this, um, it was hard for me to control my emotions. I'm pretty sure everyone will go through it at some point in their life. Um, and I definitely think that many of these tactics work. Um, there are many results to show that they do. Um, and if this isn't enough information for you, you can always go and look it up for yourself. But I hope this explaining this out and having a teen who has went through this hopefully help um, anyone else out. Awesome. Great message. So I think that was all we have for today. Before we go, I would encourage you to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, uh, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Castro, uh, YouTube, or you can catch all of our audio or video podcasts on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. And you. Well, that was actually kind of short. Um, uh, you can also... Don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Insights into Tomorrow, host. Oh, nope, wrong one. Insights into Entertainment, hosted by you and Mommy, and Insights into Tomorrow, our monthly podcast, hosted by you and my brother, Sam. Very good. And I think that's it. Another one in the books. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>